So let's talk about more lies. Let's talk about some more lies from NASA. I was looking into something called COBE. It was the uh, background microwave radiation experiment where they put this probe out in outer space and they detected any thermal readings or any um, radiation readings of any temperatures throughout the entire universe and they have precisely measured all of it and they've proved the Big Bang Theory through this, okay? Um, just letting you know it's nonsense, but um, through just looking into this, I was startled by something that was just so, so blatantly obvious. So it's Kobe, C-O-B-E. Um, NASA says that they sent this up on a Delta rocket. Furthermore, they say that the reason they sent it up on the Delta rocket was because of the Challenger space shuttle um, disaster. And at this point, it's important to bring that up because the Challenger disaster was a hoax. I'll send you some links in the description and it's important if you don't know about this to look into it because I think it's uh, six out of the seven um, uh, astronauts are still alive. I've thoroughly looked into this. And it's a Challenger disaster. In 1986, the shuttle Challenger exploded about 74 seconds after takeoff, killing all seven astronauts inside. Or did it? It turns out that six of the seven are still alive and kicking today. Ellison Onizuka claims to be his identical twin brother, Claude. Yeah, I've got an identical twin brother, Claude, too. The Challenger pilot, Mickey Smith, hasn't even bothered changing his name. He's now Professor Michael J. Smith of University of Wisconsin. Now, Krista McAuliffe was a bit of a sneaky one. She was the Challenger payload specialist quite famous for being a teacher. It turns out during her astronaut days she was using her middle name, Krista, and now she goes by her first name, Sharon, and she's a Syracuse law professor. The Challenger commander, Francis Richard Scobie, is now Dick Scobie, which sounds like a rather unpleasant disease, CEO of Cows and Trees Limited. Judith Resnick, the Challenger Mission Specialist, again hasn't even bothered changing her name. She's a professor at Yale Law. And finally, Ronald McNair, another Challenger Mission Specialist, claims to be his identical twin brother, Carl McNair. What are the odds? So I've taken a lot of time to investigate all of these people and uh, Judith Resnick is one of the the most obvious. I've, I've seen her uh, in recent years on camera uh, lecturing at Yale and compared that to Judy, Judy Resnick, the, the astronaut, and they have the same idiosyncrasies, the same facial expressions. I mean, it's the same person. Uh, Dick Scobie, Richard Scobie, um, he has such a, such a strange looking face that you just, it's unmistakable. Um, his son, the, the, the astronaut, um, his, his son is uh, also Richard Scobie. He's a uh, high ranking, he's a lieutenant general in the military. Um, Krista McAuliffe and then Sharon McAuliffe. And remember, uh, Krista McAuliffe was a school teacher. And then of course you have the Sharon McAuliffe who is aged and she's also, she's a professor. Um, today, and her husband, uh, Krista McAuliffe, her husband is named Stephen McAuliffe. He was a, um, a military JAG attorney. And 1992, he, he was appointed by George H.W. Bush, 
and he is the uh, United States District Court of New Hampshire. And you always see these guys, they're in the military and they, as they do these types of things, they get promotions because they've done their part and these families and these individuals, it's just the way it always goes. So it's, it's very obvious. I've taken a picture of uh, Krista McAuliffe and that of course her real name was uh, Sharon McAuliffe, but she went by her middle name, um, which why, well, why would you do that? But the Sharon McAuliffe, who's alive today, and they're both teachers, if you overlay their faces, I've taken it and cut out and overlay their faces and look at the facial features 50-50, it's the same person. It's the same lady, she's older. So um, there's a lot more you can pick apart, but but it's just, it it's so obvious. Um, the, the last thing is this Claude Onizuka and Carl McNair, they're the alleged brothers of the, the, the deceased, you know, coincidentally, Two of these guys were uh, had twin brothers on the same flight, and now these guys are um, traveling around the world even today. And you know, tr they, they travel together, and they they um, you know c carry the legacy basically. So it's it's just a lie. It's just another lie, and it's just time to start calling bullshit on all of this. One more thing to note is Michael J. Smith, the astronaut, is known to be a pilot and an engineer. And uh, coincidentally, there is a, an aged man who looks exactly like Michael J. Smith, the astronaut. He's still alive. And uh, he uh, is an engineer. And he works for the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So. It's the same guy. Look at the picture. It's the same guy. Not all of them, but for the most part. It was very coordinated that children all over the nation watch this, to watch this, to, to this disaster. Coincidentally, Ronald Reagan was going to have the State of the Union address that day, that evening, and the airtime was already ready to go. So instead of giving the State of the Union, it was postponed, and Reagan comes on and speaks about the, you know, tragedy of the, of the Challenger disaster hoax. And what's the most disgusting about it is that he pointedly took time to speak to the children. And I remember watching that as nine or 10 years old, as he looked and I want to say something to the school children of America who are watching the live coverage of the shuttle's takeoff. I know it's hard to understand, but sometimes painful things like this happen. It's all part of the process of exploration and discovery. It's all part of taking a chance and expanding man's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them. I've always had great faith in and respect for our space program, and what happened today does nothing to diminish it. We don't hide our space program. We don't keep secrets and cover things up. We do it all up front and in public. That's the way freedom is, and we wouldn't change it for a minute. We'll continue our quest in space. There will be more shuttle flights and more shuttle crews, and yes, more volunteers, more civilians, more teachers in space. Nothing ends here. Our hopes and our journeys continue. So anyways, there's much more that you can look into and pick that apart. I'll stop there. But that changed many of our lives. Our, our, I mean, that was shocking, especially having children in school and having that whole thing planned out. What a, what a disgusting thing to do. But... Uh, Anyways, moving on, the reason I brought this up again was because of the, uh, the Kobe experiment and them saying that they flew the, uh, the thing up on a Delta rocket. And I was watching this NASA Wallops balloon documentary and they have the guy that did this experiment and they have him in an interview as he talks about putting the thing up on a balloon. And he got the Nobel Prize for it. And there it is. They're, they're admitting that they put it up on a balloon. 
but yet you look at Yale University, um, the Encyclopedia Britannica, NASA themselves and their website saying it went on, on this Delta rocket and they had to put on the Delta because of the, the shuttle um, explosion and all of this when it's it's a lie. And I'll, I'll, I'll watch watch the uh, documentary and this will give you a lot more information about balloons and that entire balloon program if you weren't aware um, there's a great documentary you can it's about 20 minutes in, in full but I'm gonna put some clips in so you can take a look and see what the truth is and what satellites really are now as they do the interview with John Mather be real observant look behind him there is his experiment and there's a big balloon on his desk as he's talking about the experiment and it's it's right there I mean he has a picture of a balloon sitting on his desk unbelievable it's one of the best kept secrets of space science for transporting ambitious and hefty scientific experiments to near space Though they're not as flashy or headline grabbing as rockets. Oh, release the balloon, release the balloon. For the quickest and most cost effective trip to near space, they are the time honored gold standard. Satellite missions can take five to seven years and in, in millions and millions of dollars to develop, where scientific balloon instruments can be developed on a shorter time frame and a much lower cost. From atmospheric studies to the origins of the universe, they have been the vehicle of choice for some major scientific discoveries. The balloons were so large, they didn't have any way to launch them except they actually launched them from aircraft carriers. Modern scientific ballooning was born. The first spacesuits and other pioneering technologies designed for the space program were flown and tested on high altitude scientific balloons. With the modern space program now at the forefront, Winsen's balloon became a workhorse for carrying large scientific payloads to the edge of space. These balloon-based experiments began to train generations of young scientists, including one named John Mather. Mather's early experience on scientific balloons would help pave the way for his groundbreaking work on COBE, the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite. COBE's measurements of cosmic microwave background radiation would help to seal the Big Bang Theory and ultimately win Mather and his colleague George Smoot the 2006 Nobel Prize in Physics. Stephen Hawking said it was the most important scientific discovery of the century, if not of all time. And uh, a few years after that, we got the call to go to Stockholm. And so a uh, tremendously important result of the balloon program. Individ Whoa, hold the phone. So there it is. He admits it, clearly says, John Mather, he's the lead, it's his experiment, and he got the Nobel Prize for putting that thing up on a balloon, and he says it's all uh, contributed to the balloon program, so why is it that the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica and Yale University and NASA themselves are all saying it went up on a Delta, ro Delta rocket, when that's a complete lie? Hmm, that's just one more lie. How many more can we find? No organization launches more scientific balloons than NASA's Columbia Scientific Balloon Facility in Palestine, Texas. Managed by Orbital ATK for the NASA Balloon Program Office, headquartered at Wallops Flight Facility. Since 1963, CSBF has launched more than 2,600 balloons from locations all over the globe for NASA research centers, universities, and international science groups. 
The scientific balloons they use are made of a super thin polyethylene film that is 0.02 centimeters thick. They can fly payloads that weigh up to 8,000 pounds, 130,000 feet high, to an invisible ceiling where the atmosphere ends and space begins. Due to the natural difference in density between the helium gas used to fill them and the air, they expand to volumes of up to 40 million cubic feet. That's large enough to fit a football stadium inside. From places like New Mexico, Arctic Sweden, and New Zealand, to the coldest and driest continent on Earth, Antarctica. CSBF launches 10 to 15 balloons a year over four to five campaigns. When the scientific team comes to the field for a balloon campaign, they will be reassembling their instrument and getting it aligned or calibrated so that it's ready for flight. All right, so I'm gonna begin to wrap this up. There's one more point I'm gonna bring up, but let's just back up. The reason I brought this up was to prove that NASA's lying, saying that they uh, launched the, uh, the COBE microwave background radiation experiment on a Delta rocket to give everyone the impression that it went up in outer space um, on this rocket. And in fact, it went up on a balloon and <clears throat> you heard it from all of the representatives from NASA in this balloon program. It is the tried and true gold standard, faster, cheaper, more efficient um, than, than any other satellite, uh, you know, magic floating satellites in outer space, which obviously don't exist. But, but they, they say themselves, they're, they're faster, cheaper, more efficient. So what would be the point in trying to have this magic floating box flying around through outer space, which it's just impossible anyways for anyone with a thinking mind would realize it's, it's impossible. Um, so the last point I wanna bring up is uh, Mather in his interview talked about Stephen Hawking and Stephen Hawking's supposed to be the smartest guy in the world. He's a genius and all this. And um, I want to point out that Stephen Hawking is a fraud and I want to point out why. Uh, he had ALS. Any human being that has ALS dies within a few years. There's a few people that have survived past three years. Uh, one of my best friend's father, the, the guy's literally lumberjack, the strongest guy I've ever met. He got ALS and died within two or three years. No one survives this. It's a neuro, um, nerve degenerative disorder and, and it, 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 it just cripples your body and you go down and it, it, it's, it's terrible. It's a terrible, terrible disease. But Stephen Hawking is the only person on earth who lived well past 50 years with this. And he's a scrawny little guy that, you know, he just magically stayed alive for all these years. And he was presented as a fraud. He's an authority figure. And he talks about black holes and all this nonsense about the cosmos and, and you know, tries to disprove God and, and uh, he, he came out with this um, PBS documentary show called Genius. And in the show, um, it has him narrating it with his silly little robot voice. And he takes these three, um, you know, hip people through this experiment to prove that the earth is curving and to prove that water is curving. And in the in the experiment, they completely falsify and edit the um, the shot. And I'm going to show you a clip to, to prove it. I really encourage you. You can, you can find it on Prime Video. Um, it's called Genius. I'll link in the description um, the the season and the episode. But it's uh, it's really important that you watch it for yourself. Um, and then if you go to Taboo Conspiracies uh, channel, he has a, um, uh, I'll, I'll put it in the description also, but he has his own uh, <clears throat> video he put out 
to disprove it, I'm going to show you a little clip from Taboo Conspiracies video that shows the manipulation of the editing and there's no way around it i mean this is it's easy to see it is manipulated and and edited on purpose and there's other things in the show you can see when they use a laser beam and some other things you can see that that are not um up and up and it's, and it's kind of ridiculous but but the most important thing is that editing um when, when they have this helicopter fly up and down and uh, supposedly dipped down below the curvature. And it's only like six miles. I mean, I can see from, from the, the coastline out to the, the closest island is like uh, 10 miles. And I can see the shoreline and I can see an arch out there, which is 38 feet tall. And I can see the entirety of the arch from 11 miles. And that's, that's twice as far. So that in itself is ridiculous that, that they would even try to portray a six mile span across a lake and supposedly the helicopter dips down over I think it was 23 or 26 feet below the the horizon meaning that the the helicopter went down and supposedly there's this big bulge of water of the lake and and it went down below that and it's just it's just completely fabricated deception so we'll look at that and uh, wrap this up all of which supposedly show errors made by the people behind the Discovery Channel program. What drives this sort of stubborn refusal to deal with reality? Part of the problem is that even the simplest demonstrations, like Wallace's or the Discovery Channels, require careful preparation and specialized equipment. Not everybody has access to a helicopter and a telescope to do these sorts of tests. That's often a complaint that the Flat Earth people make, they need to personally experience the evidence rather than trusting the measurements of other people. Yeah, like we need a helicopter to measure the supposed curvature. But I do think it's awesome that D. Marble got it absolutely right, but we'll get back to that. It's also funny that that's the same D. Marble who proved with a laser that there was absolutely no curvature at a distance of 10 miles, much further than the Discovery Channel's bogus helicopter claim. But what makes the PBS video and to be clear, it wasn't the Discovery Channel, but PBS's series called Genius. But what makes the PBS video so rotten is that this helicopter event was entirely fabricated and it's provable. I made a video on it a while back. Remember, PBS claimed that the helicopter descended behind the curvature and then came up from behind the curvature of the Earth back into view of the telescope. But as you will see, when the helicopter descends, there is a group of birds with a peculiar flight pattern. And then when the helicopter subsequently ascends, the same birds appear and in the same exact flight pattern. Not only that, the waves match as well. Only the image of the helicopter changes, meaning that the helicopter video was added. As it lands, I got him. I got him. As it lands. Without question, PBS lied and faked the curvature. And this isn't some simple mistake. This was intentional, as it took serious effort to add a fake image of a helicopter supposedly hiding behind the curvature of the Earth. Why would PBS lie about the curvature? So to the individual who emailed me that link, send your brother the proof that PBS lied to him and is still used by globe propagandists as proof of the curvature. But here's another big lie about the curvature, this time by National Geographic. Here's a clip from an old video I made on the subject. But sure enough, as the boat reaches the horizon, the stripes begin to disappear one by one. 
It's pretty amazing. You can actually see it pretty clearly with this camera here. And you see that the red stripe that was at the bottom has completely disappeared. And it's now getting closer to sort of the middle uh, green stripe, yeah. that is. So we've lost about one and a half stripes. So this can only happen, why? Because of the curvature of the Earth. All right, well, I appreciate you watching. That brings it to an end, and um, we'll talk soon. But that's our expose of NASA and mainstream media's caught time after time in lies and just need to take the time to pointedly describe and analyze each one of them so we can share with others and point out the massive deception and get past it so that our kids and the next generation will stop living all these deceptions and move into a better world of less bullshit. So love you guys. Talk soon.